all tend to avoid, which is interspecies ethics. I think it's kind of treated as axiomatic that humans count and animals don't. Uh, I think that's too simplistic for a, for a world of ecological in, interdependence. And it also contradicts our view that we're a humane and not a barbaric society, treating living animals as no different from rocks and, and inanimate objects, I think uh, is really philosophically flawed, ethically flawed. But one of the trickiest ones that we can, we've got the tools to deal with, we just don't tend to deal with them very well, is intertemporal efficiency, uh, getting the time dimension right. And so we need to be able to assess intertemporal efficiency as well as intertemporal equity. That's uh, fairness as well as, as efficiency in the sense of not wasting what is scarce. And uh, we talk about productivity a lot in macroeconomics, and we always assume everybody knows it means labor productivity. But in fact, productivity is more than just labor productivity. Productivity is efficient use of anything that is scarce. And if we're confused about what is scarce, then we're going to be measuring the wrong kinds of productivity. And if we're going to have the wrong versions of, of wealth, we'll be maximizing the wrong thing. So there's also in uh, in... An important point, I think, to be noted in regard to assessment of the, the long-run economic benefits or, or costs of, of projects, that we need to properly reckon with the concept of irreversibility and future option values. The, the, if something is reversible, you can take higher risks than when it's not reversible. When it's irreversible, the, the bar has to be moved on a much higher, to a much higher precautionary standard. So those things have to be considered to get a proper economic evaluation. And traditional economic assessments based on the GNP, GDP impact and the number of jobs created are exceptionally crude ways of assessing economic benefits. I have to repeat that because it's just so important. We do that because we haven't got anything better, just like we used to treat certain diseases with leeches in the 18th century because we medicine hadn't advanced to the level it has today. But when we look back at those forms of medical treatment, we say they were stupid and barbaric and they were inadequate. And I think some of the ways in which we assess economic benefit are the same way. GDP does not measure many things that really matter. Depletion of natural capital perhaps being the most important one. Potential irreversibility of the losses of ecosystem structural integrity, ecosystem functional resilience and biodiversity and all the implications thereof. The horizontal distributional equity that I refer to and the vertical intergenerational distributional equity and then of course interspecies equity. GDP in certain instances can add costs and benefits together. Now, if we did anything like that in private sector enterprise accounting, we'd flunk the accountant and get rid of them. But national income accounting is not as sophisticated in that sense. It's got a more ambitious task, so that the can perhaps be excused for that. But it's got a long way to go. And GDP, of course, um, ignores non-market transactions and treats all government spending, for example, by definition producing net benefits. So we say the benefits are equal to what we spend, which is not a very good way of tracking waste. Um, so the argument that, that a project, a mega project, will increase GDP really doesn't prove anything. It's an interesting first opening statement, but it's just the beginning of the analysis, not by no means the end. Numerous economists uh, I've been reading, uh, Robin Allen, Mark Eliasson, Jeff Rubin, Mark Lee, none of whom I know, as, uh, know of as being especially heterodox, uh, certainly not people who parade around the label of ecological economists have seriously questioned the, the proponent's assertion that the NGP is in the public interest from an economic point of view. One unique distributional in issue is the question of the, the role of the First Nations in the path of this pipeline. I happen to have some quite close at hand knowledge that the coastal communities are absolutely against this project. I really don't think any realistic observer could say there's any support. So. Um, the project needs to be evaluated over its lifetime, and lifetime in this context is not some short, arbitrarily chosen time period based on the technical or economic obsolescence of the equipment being installed. It's the lifetime of all the impacts of the project. That's the relevant life lifespan that, over which the benefits must be assessed. But the assessment of impact must include all impacts on ecosystem structural integrity, ecosystem functional resilience and biodiversity, and in both terrestrial and marine biomes and over all periods in which such impacts may occur. And the assessment of impacts must include an assessment of the differential impact of this project on climate change and ocean acidification. 
have not had the time or resources to attempt to undertake such a comprehensive study myself. My strong intuition is that a proper comprehensive study of the type I believe is necessary to answer the question, is this project in the public interest, conducted in a rigorous fashion, will unfortunately produce a negative answer. Thank you. Thank you to each of you for uh, being here to express your views to us today. Good afternoon. We have another teleconference that we're going to do at this point, so relax, get a drink of water, and we'll be, well, Ms. Essek, we'll start with you after we do the teleconference. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, Mr. McQuarrie, it's Sheila Leggett speaking. Uh, who's speaking? Sheila Leggett. Uh, thank you. And uh, I, I'm the presiding member, and also we have uh, the, our, the rest of the panel, Kenneth Bateman and uh, Hans Matthews with me. Very good. And so if you would proceed with your oral statement, that would be helpful. Right at this moment? That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to share some concerns I have with regard to the proposed Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline. I choose to believe that the Creator has an unbelievable plan in mind for creation. Every, every living being is capable of following this plan. The end result would be paradise for everyone and everything. The plan is discovered by following a very simple rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What if the foundation stone upon which everything is built is evolution? In other words, experience is the teacher. We pride ourselves on being independent thinkers. However, we forget Saunders' law. Experience is a very hard teacher because she gives the test first, the lesson afterwards. In other words, we build a pipeline and it leaks and we've got to clean up all the mess and we never learn. So we continue to invent the wheel every time around. We continue to pollute with impunity. When do you suppose we will ever learn? I think the proposed pipeline to transport tar sands from Fort McMurray to Kitimat falls into that category. But there is a better way for all of creation. We ask ourselves some very basic questions. Who is going to benefit from this proposal? The rich who worship at the shrine of the bottom line? What about the environment? Experience has already taught us that pipelines leak, ships run aground, excess 
CO2 is causing global warming. Continuing to pollute with impunity has resulted in more and more devastating storms like Katrina and Sandy. Many scientists are warning us that very soon, and they mean very soon, we will reach the tipping point. Why commit global suicide for everyone and everything when there are so many alternatives that are available to us? Most people agree one day we will run out of fossil fuels. So why not use alternative sources like the sun, the wind, the tides, today, right now? China is already offering solar panels at a price below what it costs to process oil. Even better, we can make our own solar panels. And then there is hydrogen electricity compressed air. As a bonus, going green restores the balance of nature. The experience of some European countries has resulted in far more jobs going green than continuing to mine tar sands. I believe it is totally unacceptable to continue to jeopardize the future of our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren to the seventh generation. Short-term gain for the greedy comes at a very high cost to the whole of creation. The Creator's plan and design is for all creatures to have their share of the pie, their time in the sun, without compromising the integrity of the universe. We begin by showing respect for the Creator, respect for fellow humans, as well as respect for all creatures and all of creation. Caring and sharing should be what define us as humans. We must, and I believe we can, make a difference. I humbly request that the pipeline pr proposal be abandoned now. The stars and the tar sands development be abandoned now. And our time, expertise, and ingenuity be spent on a plan to go green. Thank you for your prayerful consideration of my suggestion, and peace be to you, Dan McQuarrie. Thank you very much, Mr. McQuarrie, for uh, sharing your views with us. It's my pleasure, and thank you very much for setting this up for me in this manner, as I'm uh, supposed to be in Kelowna on Monday when I was at council presenting a amendment to the bylaws so that we could have no smoking in our parks and playgrounds and so on. And so for you to accommodate this way for me, I appreciate very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. McQuarrie. So we'll move uh, back to the room now, and Ms. Essek will uh, begin with you at the table. Thank you. Oh, it does it itself. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> um, good afternoon, Ms. Leggett, Mr. Bateman, and um, Mr. Matthews. Um, I hope I can speak well. I've been losing my voice for the past couple of days. Um, I'm currently a student, and I work in a daycare. I also teach piano, so I'm working a lot with children and youth. So that's mostly what urged me to come here today. So, as a Canadian, as a British Columbian, and as a citizen intending to reside here for many decades to come, and as someone who works with the next generation, I felt compelled to speak here today. I have broad concerns about how Canada and its provinces and territories are balancing economic growth and environmental protection. I realize that both are needed, and I believe that there are better options that have yet to be explored. I'm concerned about the long-term effects that will come from the extraction of many of our natural resources, and specifically regarding this proposed Enbridge Northern Gateway project, I'm concerned about the transportation of the resource. I grew up in New Westminster and had always accepted that the Fraser River was brown. <laughs> it still had wildlife that relied on it, various fish and birds, and of course the amazing sturgeon. Um, in 1998, 
I went on a road trip with my family through British Columbia up to the Yukon. Um, and it was the first time I truly saw, saw how much natural variety there is in this amazing province. I was also stunned when we stopped the track to look at what I would have called a large stream with fairly clear water, very picturesque, um, completely different birds than what I usually saw around here. And I was stunned because my parents told me <clears throat> that this was the Fraser River. I couldn't believe them at first until I saw a sign on a bridge nearby, and I felt that my brain had to reorganize to accept this new information, to comprehend how far the water right in front of me was going to travel, how many different homes it would pass, how many different animals were relying on the river as a whole at that very moment. And I also realized how much silt and other debris and pollutants it was going to pick up on its journey from where I stood at its bank to the ocean. The proposed Enbridge Northern Gateway pipeline crosses through the Fraser River watershed and crosses many other waterways in the province. <clears throat> I am concerned that there will be a leak or a rupture, even with the safety mechanism Enbridge is proposing. And such an event would have a significant impact on all of the communities, wildlife, and industries that rely on the waterways downstream. I am not confident that these occurrences will always be prevented, and I am not confident that such leaks can be cleaned up enough to restore everything affected. So if I think of standing at that same spot far up on the Fraser River that looked like a stream, trying to comprehend how much from that point downward would be affected, it's a really terrifying thought for me. I feel similarly about the transportation of the resource via tankers from Kitimat, the west coast of British Columbia has many complex and unique ecosystems. Um, as a Girl Guide leader and a day camp leader, I've had the privilege of introducing many children and youth to some of the amazing creatures and plants that can be found in our intertidal zones. A number of these youth have not been outside of the city before. They squirm at the idea of getting mucky or touching a crab. And they have their first experiences at these camps. And these kids end up being so incredibly excited to hold slimy seaweed and bumpy seaweed and purple seaweed. And they're really excited to learn all the names of these different kinds of seaweed. They want to know why the bull kelp has a bulb. And they learn all about the kelp forests and sea otters. They learn how to gently pick up the crabs and figure out what the gender is and then carefully place them back from where they had picked them up. When I ask them at the end of the day what their favorite part was, so many of the answers from these kids are about the animals and the plants that they saw and learned about and experienced for the first time. I am concerned that a spill from a tanker is inevitable, especially considering the nature of our coastal waters and coastal geography. A spill along our coast will have a huge impact on many of our ecosystems. We rely on these ecosystems for food, for tourism, for learning how to connect with the environment and the province and country that we live in. The amazing wildlife and marine life that BC and its coasts are blessed with rely on these ecosystems and count on them being safe for the animals to swim through, live in, eat in, and reproduce and raise young in. There are many examples of spills around the world that have been incredibly challenging to contain and impossible to clean up. The tolls on the organisms and ecosystems are massive, and the damage may never be reversed. If this proposed project with pipeline and tanker transport is approved, I believe we are choosing to rob from, from the future. We are choosing to severely damage and possibly wipe out ecosystems and wildlife we are choosing to negatively impact communities and industries, and we are sending a message to everyone who comes after us, a message that when this decision was made, we were not thinking of what future generations would experience when they went to the rivers and forests or visited the coast one day with their children. By choosing to approve the Enbridge Northern Gateway Project, we are sending a clear message to everyone, everyone in BC, in Canada, and in the world. We're sending the message that we place little value in our rivers and coasts, our flora and fauna, and the lives of our children and children's children. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. That's great. Thanks a lot for your comments.
Uh, Ms. Kennedy, uh, welcome. Uh, please go ahead and present your oral statement. Thank you. I would like to thank the joint review panel, Ms. Leggett, uh, Mr. Bateman, and Mr. Matthews, as well as any those in attendance and any members of the public who are able to listen to me today for affording me the opportunity to register my account of how I believe the proposed Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline negatively affects Canada. Um, I would also like to just recognize that these hearings are taking place on unceded Coast Salish territories. So as a panel that exists to uh, review proposed energy project, projects of national significance, I'm pleased um, that you're able to consider my thoughts, and I thank you in advance for taking them seriously, um, and I thank you in advance for making good use of taxpayers' money for by considering holistically uh, what is best for Canada when the time comes to do the massive amount of homework that you've got. Um, so just a little bit about myself. In my waking hours, I am a graduate student of geography, but I speak today simply as a current citizen of BC. Um, I also speak as a born and quarter century bred Albertan who understands with the utmost clarity that the product Enbridge is generously electing to transport is at the end of the day a publicly owned gift from nature um, whose responsible use is something we owe to citizens of the rest of the world. I also speak as someone who respects the rights and wishes of those indigenous peoples whose unceded territory the pipeline builders would propose to cross and from whom the public's bitumen gift is ultimately borrowed. So there are innumerable socio-economic and ecological reasons to oppose the construction of this pipeline. Ten minutes is surely not enough to even count them all. But for my part today, I will restrict my comments um, on the grounds of economic, energetic, and ecological soundness. Enbridge has told me and my fellow citizens, whether in banner ads I see on websites or previews at movies, that their proposed Northern Gateway pipeline carrying condensate from abroad eastward to Alberta and diluted bitumen back westward to Asian markets will be good for the economy, will represent an advance in global energy systems, and will be an innocuous presence in the landscape. And so I would like to respectfully disagree with all three of these claims. First of all, in regards to the economy, the information and evidence I have reviewed leads me to conclude that the proposed pipeline is economically ill-conceived. The Gateway Project is a pipe. It's not a resource extraction project. Uh, it's a conduit to pass natural wealth over BC, not to spread wealth to BC. Uh, the range of figures I've seen for permanent new jobs seems embarrassingly small. The Gateway Project uh, seems to be more likely to leak oil into surrounding places than to leak out dollars to the residents of those places. No doubt the pipeline will make billions of dollars, but I have been attuned to the historical trajectory of primary resource development in this country for far too long to believe that those billions will be spread fairly to the public that ultimately owns the bitumen being shipped or to the caretakers of the land over which it would be shipped. Um, there is no hydrocarbon royalty fund here in BC or in Alberta since the Klein era, so I can't be expected to believe that the revenue from uh, the system which the proposed pipeline is embedded and will strengthen will spread to those whom the land and resource ultimately belong. To say this, uh, do not think that I am against economic development. Indeed, it is because I am in favor of robust economies that I am opposed to the development of this pipeline. The proposed pipeline threatens numerous existing economies that are much more environmentally sustainable and that sustain far more than 200 to 1,000 full-time jobs. Nor to say all this should you think that I am knee-jerk against oil per se. My life, like all of ours, is deeply shaped by a structural dependence on hydrocarbons. But I am not in favor of increasing that dependence during a time when climate change and declining energy returns from hydrocarbon developments indicate that we need to make a serious step change towards low and post-carbon systems. So not only is this pipeline not good for the economy in this narrow sense of the term economic, which we've heard a bit today, the standard version with supply and demand curves carved out of 2D models and formulas, it is also not good for the economy in a wider energetic sense of the term. And this is the second major reason I stand in opposition to the proposed pipeline. So when I say that it does not make sense energetically, uh, the proposed pipeline would ship bitumen from the oil sands of the Athabasca region of Alberta and to produce bitumen is highly energy intensive. As we know, it takes a high amount of energy input to produce bitumen energy output. 
It has a very low what is called energy return on investment. About 2.5 units of energy are needed to produce one unit of Alberta bitumen energy. This is about 40 times lower than the boom days of the 30s. So precisely when we need to be shifting to investing in lower carbon energy systems, I believe the proposed pipeline would represent a mass massive capital investment in a very high carbon system. It will be a multi-billion dollar stranded asset in any future energy system that is not utterly suicidal. This brings me to my third point of opposition to Enbridge's proposed pipeline. It poses, in my review of all available information, very high and unacceptable ecological risks. We are talking about an extremely product, uh, polluting product being shipped through extremely dangerous waters and shores with little track record or background science to instill my confidence. Once there is a multi-decadal project on the science of marine bitumen spills akin to the experimental lake areas, I will be able to believe Enridge has scientific evidence of the safety of the project that it proposes. But I do not elect to have the western coastline of this country act as a massive ecological experiment and a seriously underfunded one at that. I, like many people watching the issue of liquid hydrocarbon transport along the coast of British Columbia, understand that an oil spill in our waters is a matter of when, not if, a spill occurs. We only need to look at the 2007 Trans Mountain Pipeline spill in Burnaby to see that spills will and do happen in our waters, and that a massive increase in the volume of transport, a massive increase in the scale, complexity, and danger of this transport will increase the likelihood of damaging spills. This is because we understand that oil spills in marine environments are part of what has been called the normal accident. The normal accident is a so-called disaster or catastrophe caused not by some random operator error or equipment malfunction, but from systematic cascading series of failures ultimately due to management and organizational systems. The oil spill is a normal accident. It is a system accident systemic to the extremely complex systems of marine hydrocarbon transport. It is precisely because a serious pipeline spill or marine accident associated with this pipeline is a matter of when, not if, that I stand opposed to the proposed pipeline. Public confidence in the operation of pipelines and high-risk high marine hydrocarbon production installations is utterly shaken at this time in history. This is not the risk-averse, hysterically fearful viewpoint of misinformed laypersons. This is pattern recognition of normal accidents. The BP Deepwater Horizon blowout, the Enbridge Kalamazoo spill, the spills near, near Sundry and Rainbow Lake this summer. Far from anomalies in otherwise safe operating records, these events signal so -called, that so-called accidents happen. They are a matter of course. They are a normal course of action in the game of hydrocarbon transport. And the addition of heavy bitumen and narrow dangerous water courses into the mix makes the stakes of this game even higher. From the narrow, small, standard economic calculations to a wider energetic understanding of the economy, out to the wider environment in which these economic and energy systems are embedded, the proposed pipeline is flawed and mitigably. The proposed pipeline is too high a price tag for those who would ultimately foot the bill, the public, at every step of the way. As a British Columbian and a citizen of the world, there is no price tag no increased revenue share for BC that would make the proposed pipeline an economically or an environmentally sound decision. I am one of thousands involved in this process who don't want a bigger piece of the pie. We want a different pie altogether. One based on economies that are embedded in local social systems and ones that are sustainable for local and global ecologies. The fact is we cannot eat GDP. We cannot continue down a development trajectory based on an energy source with plummeting energy return on energy invested. To conclude, I will state unequivocally that I recommend that the members of the panel do not grant approval for the proposed pipeline. I can only imagine I am one of an overwhelming majority that hopes that reason and good consciousness will prevail in the decision-making process overall. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Do I now pronounce your name Dowdswell? Dowdswell. Dowdswell, thank you for coming. Please present your views. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Global addiction to Alberta's energy sector has become the answer to how we have been taught to deal with dirty oil. <clears throat> The expansion of these markets looms over Canada's environments like an evil supervillain with a grin the size of a 2,000-kilometer pipeline. 
All humans at the hands of these supervillains are living with gas pumps stuck into vehicles like a drug addict's arm is stuck with needles. With that imagery, I ask, does this addiction to Canada's oil give humans the right to destroy our beautiful yet fragile environments here in British Columbia to obtain their fix? Does it allow the government to ignore the opposition of First Nations? Does this addiction make it okay to endanger all types of species, including humans, in the event of an oil spill around any of the sectors of the proposed pipeline? <clears throat> The Enbridge pipelines would cut across nearly 800 streams and rivers, including BC's two largest wild salmon watersheds, the Fraser and the Skeena. A pipeline spill near salmon spawning habitat would be near impossible to clean up. What do we stand to lose? Our province's most iconic species, the backbone of our cultures and economy. <clears throat> All for some added value, a couple extra bucks per barrel and a higher GDP. Is that really a good idea? It's a good idea if you like putting the environment at risk. Risks that can put the seas, air, and lands into a black death but allow for Enbridge's account to stay out of the red. Alberta's Dirty Kitchen is cooking up a recipe of ignorance, pipelines, tankers, and tar sands that easily smells like a disaster waiting to happen. <clears throat> Big global oil companies' attitude in regards to health, safety, and environmental matters that surround oil seem to be rape, pillage, and destroy, all in the name of economic growth, supply, demand, and more jobs. They talk about world markets and how prosperous we can be as Canadians if we sell Alberta's stock of Earth's bounty, located in northern Alberta, which is approximated around 1.78 trillion barrels. Divide that with an average of 3.5 million barrels per day being produced in the tar, tar sands. At, a, at that rate, that works out to be 508,571 days of oil production, 1,393 years of tar sands production. That's a lot of years to be raiding northern Alberta. So start shipping tar sands to Kidmat and sell some of those barrels to foreign markets. At what cost, though? 1,200 long-term jobs, some extinct animals, bunch of new cancers, barren space-like wasteland, and a very small piece of the pie. These are just some of the effects that will hurt BC in the long run. <clears throat> Enbridge says $1.2 billion in tax revenues for BC, $81 billion in projected government revenue, and $270 billion to Canada's GDP over 30 years. <clears throat> Seems a little unfair for British Columbians. These figures do not give the right for humans to destroy the natural environments the pipeline will consume, spill or no spill. These figures of an oil-addicted nation can likely expect many small spills over expect many small spills every year and a catastrophic spill of over 10,000 barrels every 12 years. Figures that are based on a report from the Simon Fraser University. British Columbia would be vulnerable to an oil spill disaster on the scale of the Exxon Valdez, which could devastate the coastal environment and way of life for generations. Between 2000 and 2010, it's been estimated that Enbridge has lost 132,715 barrels of hydrocarbons into farms, wetlands, and waterways on the continent. Enbridge averages an oil spill a week. Enbridge also made headlines in July 2010 when one of its pipelines caused the largest oil spill in the history of the U.S. Midwest. Three million liters of tar sands crude spilled into the Kalamazoo River watershed in Michigan. Tar sands oil is heavier and more corrosive than conventional crude, making it more likely to cause pipeline leaks along any route. These are some of the costs and risks associated with selling our environment for supply and demand. And for what? Money? Greed? Power? Political gain? Or a Canadian gross domestic product? This addiction has already begun to endanger all different types of species. In the event of an oil spill around any of these sectors of the proposed pipeline, Enbridge says they have safety implementations and protocols that they use to manage and take care of oil spills. A general oil spill response plan, a GOSRP, as they, they will call it, based on forecast marine operations. They say, Enbridge, uh, the credible worst case discharge volume estimate for the marine area is 36,000 meters cubed. This volume is based on a credible worst case discharge from a very large crude carrier, a VLCC, tanker involved in a collision. This is unsettling news if this were to happen anywhere near our coast. This is too much of a hazard to even think of letting a scenario like this one near our coast, even if it's considered improbable that it won't happen. <clears throat> what if it does? VLCC traffic does not need to be floating in and around our already sensitive coastal creatures and their habitats. Environment Canada states that Cape Strait is the fourth most dangerous body of water in the world. 
do not consider this particular area for transporting Gilbert. This is a big reason why the Northern Gateway project should not happen. We do not need to put our environment at risk. The Enbridge pipeline would also put another value at risk, hope. Hope that another kind of world is possible and that it's not too late to stop the downward spir spiral of environmental degradation and particular the threat of human-caused global warming. <clears throat> Instead of investing $5.5 billion into these pipelines, moving dirty oil that help cause climate change, Enbridge needs to focus on investing more with renewable energy and expand without fossil fuels. Enbridge says they want to lead the way now by investing in renewable and alternative energy sources that have less impact on the environment. Then start the transition now and stop trying to transport bitumen in a pipe through BC and stop selling fossil fuels. Just imagine a world not relying on declining fossil fuel reserves. Bring attention now to a declaration titled Save the Fraser Declaration. This is a document which must not be ignored. Save the Fraser Declaration outlined the creed of which most of humanity has come to forget. First Nations ancestors have valued nature for millennia. Here is a quote from the Save the Fraser Declaration. Water is life for our peoples and for all living things that depend on it. The Fraser River and its tributaries are our lifeline. A threat to the Fraser and its headwaters is a threat to all who depend on its health. We will not allow our fish, animals, plants, people, and ways of life to be placed at risk. From the soil lands to Aboriginal creed, I wish for this panel and to all who are listening to take the time to understand that tankers should not be allowed on our northern coast for many reasons, some that were outlined here. This is not a time to be screwing with Mother Nature when we depend on her so badly. Please recognize that as an individual, we stand alone in a sinking ship, but together as a renewable energy group, we can create a wave of change that will be beneficial for us all in our close and distant futures. No tankers, no pipeline. Thank you. Thank you to each of you for taking the time to be here. You look like you represent uh, a generation who's coming along into uh, further uh, being further thought leaders in the world, and uh, it's great that you step forward to present your uh, viewpoints to us. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Essek, I understand why you might have a bug if you work with children that often. <laughs> Good afternoon. Mr. Judy, you look like you're ready to proceed. Would you uh, please go ahead with your oral statement? Thank you so much. Thank Good you. afternoon, panel. My name is Carol Judy, and for the last 15 years I've made my home here in the lower mainland. It might be useful for you to know that I was born, raised, educated, and spent my working life in Alberta. What an exciting experience you've been having. I expect that by now you're pretty familiar with all the well-reasoned and completely compelling arguments as to why the pipeline should not proceed. I've decided to give you a break and avoid getting into another long, detailed, backward account of how it is that we've gotten to this point that we are now, where we, where we and I mean all of us, are causing serious damage to the earth, including its atmosphere and climate. When I look around today, I see that many people find it difficult to know what to do next. The facts are clear. Our unprecedented exploitation of the Earth's resources 
have resulted in badly stressing it. With every accumulating effect, we set in, in, in place changes to our climate in a way that will be devastating and extremely difficult to slow down, let alone reverse. As individuals, many of us feel very power, powerless to 